TGIF. <laughs> Likeable science on a Friday uh, with Ethan Allen. Hi, Ethan. Hi, Jay. <laughs> we have more for you. You know, we really enjoyed the discussion about graphene last week. Uh, it was sort of opened my mind and opened yours, I think, just to compare notes about the incredible things that could happen with graphene. And it is already, you know, discovered. It's just a matter of implementing that discovery and commercializing that discovery, and it will be disruptive, I guarantee it. Absolutely. So it, it opens new thoughts, new, new discussions for us to follow that track, you know? Mm -hmm. And I must say, over the weekend, I saw a movie which I urge everybody to watch. It's a documentary movie, just came out, it's on cable. It's called Zero Days. Zero Days is about the Stuxnet virus. Very interesting. It was a collaborative effort, you know, as revealed, because it was secret for a while, uh, between the United States and Israel. They didn't always agree on things, but at the end, um, they dispatched a, a virus. It went worldwide, um, but it had the skill, the smarts, to find its way into the centrifuges in the Iranian uh, atomic, uh, you know, plant in Iran. Um, in order to stop what the, the making of the nuclear bomb there. And th this virus was able to uh, penetrate a certain electronic control device made by Siemens. Um, it knew well enough what control device it was, and, and it, you know, it didn't touch anything else in the world, just this control device and just this device in Iran. Amazing. It cost billions and billions and billions, like $50 billion to make this. Could put on a, on a thumb drive, you know. Um, anyway, it destroyed a lot of a lot of these uh, centrifuges, many, many hundreds of them, uh, and it set the, the Iran the nuclear program back for a while. Not oh. for that long, but for a while. You're talking about a computer virus. Yeah. Okay, I thought you were talking sorry about. Sorry if I didn't make that clear. <laughs> as a biologist, yeah. I tend to think of viruses as these yeah, strange little proteins. One things. looks at <laughs> what is already in one's mind. But you know, the point about that is, uh, it, it was unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And zero days, the, the name of the movie means that this, this proliferates without the necessity for clicking on your mouse. You don't have to download the file. You don't have to you know, open a file on your browser, nothing like that. Uh, it just touches your machine and bingo, you're infected. Now, infected isn't necessarily bad because it's not attacking you, mm -hmm. attacking somebody else, but it's going worldwide. They found it all over the world. Huh. But it only attacked these one control devices, one type of control device in, in um, Iran. So, I mean, this opens new doors on the possibility of uh, electronic viruses, computer viruses, uh, and, and for that matter, cyber war. Okay? And, and the bottom line there is that we are probably already in a cyber war, mm -hmm. where nation states play, where they spend tens of billions in order to develop mm -hmm. these things, where they have very smart uh, groups of young people who understand about programming and understand about building viruses. Um, and they line up on companies and governments and other places, and they attack them on a regular basis. There are multiple different kinds of attacks. They don't necessarily do anything destructive, but they, you know, they're peeling off information, mm -hmm. and they're, you know, they're filling their own database with the information from somebody else for whatever purpose, however, how long in the future. But the point, point is that it's happening now, mm -hmm. and we are in a war of cyber war deterrence. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I can bring your city down. Mm -hmm. I can bring your utility company down. Mm -hmm. I can bring your grid down if I want. But I don't do that because if I do that to you, you're going to find a way to get back and do that to me. Right. And before you know it, you know, we have cities going down all over the, the world. Right. So we don't yeah. do that. It's sort of like mutually assured destruction back from the nuclear it was, It's age, like right? the nuclear deterrence. Right. Right. It's the same concept right. and it's the same thing happening right now. And in many ways, it's the same players. Right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, because um, you know, Russia is definitely involved in this. Uh, so, I mean, it just shows you that science in general um, is moving so quickly mm -hmm. that the public, you know, ordinary guys like, like me anyway, um, don't realize uh, how mm -hmm. fast it's moving. And they don't realize that, you know, we're on a, we're on a cusp in some ways of, you know, the implementation of science that, that was not known by the public, but all of a sudden, the commercialization, implementation of it, you know, is going to have a huge effect, disruptive effect on our society. Uh, and I find that very interesting. But for example, one of the elements that's coming up uh, on our program on energy on, on Tuesday is the effect of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Hydrogen is uh, remarkable as a storage device, as a way to do clean energy. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the, the technology is, is quite impressive right now. And one of these days, it's going to go mainstream, center stage, 
and we're going to see uh, you know hydrogen as a substitute for many other devices and many other different kinds of renewables uh, that we have now. But <clears throat> you you come with gifts. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Jay. <laughs> you come with gifts, and it's the same kind of thing. It's it's nanotechnology in many areas, which is not well known by the public, which has been under the hood for maybe a few years anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, which is almost ready to, for prime time, come out and do either very positive things or possibly very negative things. And I think the public, you know, should understand what's, what's cooking, literally cooking. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's funny that the, you know, Ocean across the street over here mm -hmm. had a subsidiary and then it was spun off called um, Nanotech Hawaii or something mm -hmm. like that. They're not in business as far as mm -hmm. I know anymore, but they were visionary in the sense that they realized, this is 10 years ago, um, that nanotechnology would change the world. You know, you can call it on a gross basis material science, but it's, it's material science on such a small scale that you, you need another word to define it like nanotechnology. Right, yeah. yeah. So right. let's talk about some of the incredible things you listed here um, and uh, uh, what, they, what they can do for us and how we can implement them uh, and whether, you know, you can do this at home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. First, you, you, you hit a key point. It's, a lot of this stuff is now the science of the very small. You know, it, it, it's science on a scale that we couldn't manipulate matter on before. Uh, nano is a prefix meaning a billionth, basically. It's a Greek word, nanos dwarf. And so it means very, very tiny stuff. And, and a lot of the measurements in this field are done in nanometers. And now a nanometer is thus a billionth of a meter. And since a meter is about three feet, that's not very much. Indeed, the, the definition I like for a, a nanometer is a nanometer is the amount your fingernails grow in one second. Whoa. Which, wow. okay. considering how slowly your fingernails grow, they don't, they, don't, yeah. Yeah, they don't grow much. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's a tiny measurement. And scientists are now able to manipulate matter on that scale, on that size scale. So it, it's literally moving atoms around in some cases, or small, or small molecules around, and building things up atom by atom by atom. So if I asked you how they do this, is there a simple answer? There are various techniques, none of which are dead simple, but typically they start with some substrate, they spritz stuff into the air over, or into the vacuum over it, some of it adheres, then they may spritz something else on that only adheres to the spots where the first stuff stuck, and they begin to stack things up, different compounds, and they've just gotten very good at controlling all this now by knowing what what materials to use under what conditions, and they can build very elaborate, and we'll see later on, very structured bits and pieces of, of literally, you know, a, a few atoms, a dozen atoms, 20 atoms, 100 atoms, and now are, they're going beyond sort of simple shapes. They're actually starting to develop working parts, little tiny atomic level machines, basically. You say machine, but that's so interesting. You know, don't we have little machines that go do medical things in your body, but they're actually machines? We could instruct them, they, we give them command control, we can make them do things. But how much of a machine are they? Do they have little gears and things and well, little the, screws that hold them together? <laughs> how does that work? They're, they're literally now developing little, literally wheel and axle kind of, of devices on an on atomic with level. atoms. Yeah, well. yeah where, where literally your, your axle is one molecule with, with a couple other molecular wheels attached to it. And something else is riding on that that's another, you know, a, a bigger protein, for instance. Stopping there, I mean, if, if I can do that, if I can build a machine, instruct a machine at an atomic level, God knows where I can send that, deploy that. Yeah. God knows what kind of amazing things I can do with that. I mean, this is, I mean, this is very much how, your, how your, the fibers of your muscles all work, right? They're, it's a little machine sort of uh, ratcheting along, basically, uh, on, on a molecular level. Uh, clicking along, locking, click, lock, click. And so it's the same kind of control, yeah. And if you're controlling matter on that level, there's sort of no end to what you can do. And you, you can make a lot of them, too. Typically, it's not just one. Typically, right. That's the thing is they're getting better and better at scaling this stuff up and being able to make billions of these things at once now. Um, yeah. So, so, I mean, what comes to mind is that old movie, I can't remember the name right now, is about um, uh, deploying little machines in your body to do biological things and either save you or kill you, whatever it was. Oh, yeah. Remember so that in, movie? It was a movie. Incredible Voyage or something? Yes, that's it. Yeah. Incredible yeah. Right, right. yeah, that was it. Right, right. Um, so, uh, but what you say, it sounds like we could go in our bodies now 
And with these little machines, we could change the way things work. They're, they're already doing some of that. Uh, that is, even some years ago, the uh, scientists realized that, for instance, uh, tumor, uh, cancerous tumors have to have blood vessels flowing into them. But the blood vessels in cancerous tumors are slightly different than your standard little capillaries. The joints between the individual capillaries are leakier, they're a little bit bigger. They're sort of sloppy in, in a tumor. And because they're a little bit bigger, if you slip just the right size, little tiny particle of gold in, into your bloodstream, oh. they will leak out through those joints in the, and they'll leak out and accumulate only in your tumor. It's a chemical effect. On yeah, the, it's on it's the just tumor. a physical effect. Do just, we know why this happens? Well, it's, it's sort of simple physics. They, they can't leak from tight capillaries in your healthy tissue, but the looser, leakier capillaries in your tumors are where they leak out by sort of by default. And then they accumulate in a tumor. You can then shine long infrared light, which is harmless to you, passes through our tissue quite painlessly. And the little gold nanoparticles grab this stuff, start the, sort the of- The light activates the gold. They, they, they vibrate, basically. It vibrates the gold. And, and become very hot, basically. So what it is, your tumor then heats up, basically, because it's got all these little gold nanoparticles stuck in it. You fry the and, tumor. And you fry the tumor with essentially touching nothing else. And this is at the atomic level, no, the molecular level. Well, yeah, yeah, these are clusters of probably a few tens of thousands of molecules, basically, you yeah. know. Uh, yeah. But you know, it's still really tiny stuff. Yeah. And that, that, that sort of crude level stuff, that was happening five, ten years ago. They yeah. were working on that. Well, I mean, it suggests, I mean, you know, the cure, the cure for cancer goes in many different directions and other diseases. Um, but the most promising, seems to me, is when you get right down there, you know, in or with the cancer cell, and you attack it with something you can control, and now you've, you know, now you've beaten it, at least at that location. Right. And if you can do that all over your body, then you can, you can really change the way things are working. Right, and again, because of the control they now have, they can take a very potent cancer drug, encapsulate it in a, in a shell so that it's protected, won't get digested, won't be degraded, put specific things on the outside of that shell that will only bind to cancer cells, so these, this encapsulated drug now goes through a system, locks onto cancer cells, and then at a given signal, perhaps, will unleash that drug right into the cell, basically. I, don't, I mean, this kind of control yeah. is, is just completely unheard of. But will it, will it go um, to that certain electronic control device in the nuclear facility in Iran? Is it, <laughs> well, I mean, this is, is the same thing, isn't it? It, it is. It's, it's the biological. That's what you, you were telling me about this. And I was thinking it's real viruses. viruses. <laughs> and, and it wasn't. How do they get into the centrifuge? I don't understand. You know, viruses aren't really going to invade uranium. You know? This is an unrehearsed show. We're going to take a short break so we can recover from that. We'll be right back. Hi, my name is Kim Lau, and I'm the host of Hawaii Rising. You can watch me every other Monday at 4 p.m. Aloha, I'm Chantelle Seville, host of the Savvy Chick Show on Think Tech Hawaii. Now, we are on a mission to help young women and girls achieve their dreams and looking forward to sharing with you one episode a month where a young woman or a girl will share her dream or ultimate goal with you and hope that we can all get together behind her to achieve that goal. Look forward to seeing you there. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I serve as Senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on ThinkTech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our healthcare system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting ThinkTech. A thousand different products now. Okay, it's Ethan Allen and me exploring very small things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the fact is the small things are the future, yes. not big things, small things. It's all a world of miniaturization and, and, and getting down there be, between the atoms. What an exciting thing, incredible, as it were, incredible journey. Uh, okay, we so we have a little footage. We're going to play a footage about, about gecko adhesives. And that's also a nanotech phenomenon and one we can control. And uh, uh, Ethan's going to tell us about it as we play this movie. Sure. So geckos, of course, can climb walls, run across the ceiling. You've seen all of this. And you wonder, how does this happen, right? Because how do they stick? And that's always intrigued people. And in, in this video, you see this guy climbing a glass wall, basically. And what it is, is gecko feet have little tiny ridges on them. And these ridges have little tiny, tiny 
uh, filaments, little hairs on them, basically. And hairs on the ends don't have much surface area, but if you press the hair down, then suddenly it's lying on a substrate and it's got a lot more surface area, basically. And there are actually small attractive forces between things that are pushed together. And when you multiply those times a gazillion, as, as in these hairs, you get good adhesion. And so the gecko can then control by sort of rolling his feet on and off how, how much he, he wants to stick, just as this guy basically is, is pressing in and uh, lifting off and sliding up and pressing in. Is he in. using some gecko adhesive yeah, device yeah, on those? Yeah, those pads on his hand have, have essentially lots of little pads that have lots of little uh, filaments basically on them that basically are just sticking to the glass simply from what are called van der Waals forces, these forces that exist between anything that, that's pressed to anything else. Do the, do the vandrels have to be a certain kind of material or no. just small enough? Yeah, just small enough. Really, the size, the size is critical. And that's, that's the whole thing with nanotechnology is it's all size-dependent phenomena. And so, uh, yeah, it, it, it's truly an amazing uh, thing. And you can, you can begin to see right there, there's some highly useful things. But now they're already making what, what they call gecko tape, tape that, that runs on the same principle. Um, so you can peel off this tape, stick it down on something, and peel it off. And making this tape that will work the same kind of tape can work underwater, which is sort of a nice thing to be able to tape something. Yeah, yeah. A, well. a footnote to that, when I saw your notes, and I, I thought to myself, you know, the big problem in um, ocean energy, uh, or for that matter, uh, ocean energy thermal conversion, or ocean thermal conversion, um, OTEC, is uh, the corrosion aspect mm -hmm. and dealing with, uh, you know, all the things in the ocean. Mm -hmm. But if you had uh, these natural um, molecular level uh, nanotechnologies like, like adhesive that works the same way a gecko works, you might be able to beat that corrosion. There might be able, a nanotechnology down there that would, that would actually be sustainable. And possibly. The, the other route to that is you, the, they can now create what they call super hydrophobic surfaces, surfaces that cannot get wet because of their atomic structure. Basically, water can't actually intrude down to the surface. It's kept away by a coating. You're, you're suggesting that the only way things can get wet is if the surface has a certain porous quality. Well, a certain flatness to it. If you, if you make your surface rough in the right way, you can keep water molecules from ever touching your surface, basically. So, so I, if I could make clothing, for example, out and, of that, they, it would never get wet. They, and it would never in, intrude they, through, it never, never go through the material. Well, they, they do that, but they actually do it on the, on the threads. So they weave the clothing so it's still breathable, lets air flow through. But literally, when you, you wash a shirt made with this stuff, and your shirt itself is actually not getting wet, which is a strange oh, phenomenon. It, it, it washes happen, yeah. the dirt off of it without the shirt actually getting wet. Yeah. The dirt gets wet, but the yeah. shirt doesn't. Miracle clothing. Yeah, and, and you could envision if you could do this well enough, you could coat whatever you wanted sitting down underwater with this stuff, and it wouldn't ever get salt water. Well, I guess I could also make a shirt that wouldn't get dirty. Yes, there's a, actually, there's, there's a guy who used to go around at the nanotech conferences in his white suit and with chocolate sauce. And then he'd ladle the chocolate sauce onto his white suit, and it would just basically flow off and leave, oh. leave his suit untouched. Think how much money would save on cleaning <laughs> yeah, bills. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and this stuff is all out there. It's 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 around now. And yeah, it's got some downsides. There are people expensive. Who, well, some of it's expensive. A lot of it has to do with they've dumped a lot of uh, nanoscale silver around in products that now is washing down into the uh, sewage treatment plants and killing off all the beneficial bacteria oh, in the sewage oh, treatment oh, plants. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, and they're wondering, are, are, is this going to cause trouble down the road? You know, uh, well, you know, that raises the whole, the whole parallel to GMO. Um, uh, you know, I personally don't think there's any danger from GMO, but a lot of people who do, and uh, they, they say, we, we don't know the four corners of the effects of GMOs. We haven't had the experience, mm -hmm. and it could, you know, make make you make make you green. Uh, it could dissolve you, like uh, you know, the light of the night of the living dead, mm -hmm. or something. Uh, you know, you step on it, and your ankles d dissolve. And <clears throat> that's, that's not so, but you worry about that. Now, in the case of nanotechnology that does these remarkable, miraculous things, we don't know all the effects, such as with the silver particles. Um, could it be that there are? you know, really destructive effects out there that we have to watch out for. Well, again, there, there's nothing particularly new. We've been dealing with nanoscale stuff in our environment all along. The little salt crystals that blow in the air all around Hawaii here are, are uh, on a nanoscale, and you breathe them in every day, and, and they don't seem to have any pretty bad effect on us. There are classes of things that, that have become more common now, so they, they, they uh, 
and you get particles of certain, certain kinds of size ranges, they tend to get into your lungs better than they get out of your lungs. They thus tend to accumulate in your lungs and clog up. You probably don't want a lot of that stuff floating around the environment because, mm -hmm. yeah, that's going to... Yeah. There are some things that some of... Uh, uh, molecular species that get, get into microorganisms and, and disrupt them. The silver is a, is a classic example. That, that microbes do not do well with, with atomic silver and it kills them. And that's yeah. why it's, that's why it's so, that's sort of its good side and its bad side both, right? This raises a very interesting, you know, we talked about weapons of mass destruction and uh, chemical warfare, mm -hmm. biological warfare, all this. This is not chemical necessarily. Well, it could be. Uh, it's not biological necessarily, um, and yet uh, this kind of nanotechnology could be destructive, and thus it could be a weapon of war too. Get into your system, do bad things. Uh, what you're exposed to it, it goes to the right place. Sort of like my Stuxnet example. Um, it goes to the right place and does the wrong thing. Yeah, right? it's if, possible. If, if you found the right the right thing that could target your specific enemies and not come back and target you. you know, and that's, of course, the trick. Is well, that's the trick. Essentially, you we're all... Throw yourself at the wrong end of the stick. Right, right. <laughs> exactly. We're, we're all pretty similar, fundamentally. Yeah, another hurts. another deterrence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, as, again, as we understand uh, living systems in greater and greater depth, though, I mean, that kind of situation is not completely unrealistic. Yeah. People find that there are certain groups who may be more susceptible to some peculiar little molecular species than, uh, than most of the rest of us, and yes, then somebody who doesn't like that particular group might choose to unleash a bunch of that. Yeah. And, uh, What's remarkable is that we get it from nature, like the gecko thing, and there was right. another, there was adhesives from geckos, and uh, there were other things right. where atoms play a role in, in, oh, yeah. in the natural process of the world, oh, and we learn from them. Yeah, they're absolutely. The other, uh, other sort of adhesive is the, the mussels, the little sh uh, mussels that sit on the rocks on the shore. And if you think yes. about it, they're, they're really tightly attached to those rocks, right? You know, with the, the little, there what they is, call yeah. the, 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 the beard from the muscle. Yeah. Those are called bissel threads. The special properties? So yes. That's yeah. not microscopic. No, no, that's just you standard, can see that. right, it's yeah. standard muscle. But those bissel threads are a very interesting thing. How do you stick something onto a rock that can be hot and dry, bakingly dry, it's rough, it can be pounded by surf, it can be cold and wet and underwater? You know, you can't walk out there with your Elmer's glue and stick that on it. You can't walk out there with your tube of epoxy and stick that on it. You can't walk out there with a hot glue gun and make things stick on that. You know, and yet these muscles do it like that, you know. How? Well, it's, again, Do we understand? Yes, that? they're actually beginning to understand what the genes are that produce the particular weird proteins that are able to work and stick so well between this, the sort of the core of the thread and the rock, whether the rock is wet, dry, hot, cold. Salty does not matter, you know. This this stuff has sort of through selection has been selected to be a very effective adhesive. You know, uh, you know so far you've talked about it adhe adhesive, right. but I I think we ought to we ought to address the question of whether this could be happening in some other way. Oh, yeah. um, you know, the, the opposite of adhesion, a push away, sure. uh, or some kind of chemical reaction. Um, that, that happens at, at the natural level that we could use in some way, positive or negative. At, uh, sure, well, well I, I mentioned the, the super hydrophobic stuff. Yes. Which is, is again, the same thing, it's yes. keeping water off. And they make, uh, you know, uh, hydrophobic clothing now uh, to keep your uh, clothing dry. Yes. You can, coat your, you can coat your glasses with the stuff and have water essentially never really get on your glasses. It'll, it'll be run off immediately. Yes. Interestingly enough, with water, there's, you can take the other approach too. You can make it very hydrophilic, so it pulls the water flat onto it, so the water never beads up on it. As soon as the water hits, it's it's, it's a sheet of water. It's, it's a smooth sheet of water instead of being a droplet. This reminds me of a, an OC16 movie we made with Angel Yanagihara at the university, and she's like the world's expert in, in box jellyfish, uh -huh, okay. and she uh, you know does lots of testing and samples right you know mm -hmm. right off Waikiki, mm -hmm. get these box jellyfish and see right. how they sting you. Um, and it's remarkable how they sting you. And I don't think it's completely known exactly how that sting works, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly you can duplicate it and you can take a look microscopically at what's going on, mm -hmm. and maybe you know, atomically even too. But the question is, um, you know, what is it doing to give this use? Some of these, some of these stings are really awful. Mm -hmm. They just tear the flesh apart. It eats you. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not only the jellyfish, it, it's the bacteria, which is a larger size thing. You know, and that also eats you. 
Um, so I, what I'm saying is you could learn from the environment, from the natural environment, about processes we don't fully understand yet, and you could apply that to, you know, human beings or otherwise, um, if, if we could figure out exactly how to copy it and change a lot of things in the world using mm. natural processes that are right out there yeah, now. Yeah, this whole, it's, it's an area called biomimetics, you know, mimic, mimicking biology, yeah. basically, and it's a very hot field. Yeah. That's what the gecko feet thing was, the, the bissel threads, are, they're developing underwater adhesives now. But yes, they're, they're, it's all over the lotus leaves with the first classic example of a, of a very hydrophobic yeah. uh, uh, surface that was studied in nature, you know, and they looked at why does a lotus leaf, the water just beads up and runs right off of it, and they never really get wet. Just beginning, isn't it? Yeah. Just, you know, we, one of our um, Think Tech staff, a guy named Michael Rodriguez, very competent guy, he's uh, in the engineering school at UH mm -hmm. at Holmes Hall, and uh, he's on an internship now. That's why you won't see him around mm -hmm. here today. Um, at UCLA, I think. Um, and what he's working on, he's in the medical school there. He's an engineering student working in the medical school on these miniature things that have to do with what biomedical engineering. Yeah. It's a big field. It's a huge field, yeah. I, when I was at University of Washington, we had graduate students in chemical engineering doing rotations through a, a clinical program, working with the clinicians to help them figure out, like, how do we, how do, we do this process, you know, and do it less invasively or less harmfully or faster or, you know, yeah, whatever. It's the intersection of the sciences. That's, that's where a lot of very hot stuff is happening now, yeah. It's not so what you learn in science. one area, you can apply in the other, you can bring them all together exactly. and have phenomenal results. Exactly, exactly. It's why, why collaboration is so critical in science. Yeah. Okay, last question before we're done. Does the United States government recognize the importance of this work and this science and this phenomenon of the intersection of the sciences and nanotechnology? You can give me a word, word, one word answer if you like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in a qualified yes, way. But. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, exactly. Don't you think it ought to? Oh, yes, 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 <laughs> yes definitely. <laughs> You know, the problem is that uh, the economy in general has a, you know, a, a serious effect on funding for research right. and science. And uh, these, these things, um, you know, they may not appear to the government or to the people, the public, uh, to be all that important because they're sort of speculative at first. But then when you get down into it and you, you find out more about it, you realize the potential is huge and disruptive. Yes. And then you're sorry you didn't put the money in in the first place. Right. So, um, take camera one, Ethan. Talk to the government. Talk to them now. Tell them what they should do. So there, there is actually a move afoot now from the National Academy of Sciences. They have posted a list of 20 questions that they think the presidential candidates should address. And to really, uh, they're important questions. They're big questions. You know, where, what are we going to do in space? What are we going to do in biomedicine? And we need to be aware of this. And we need our presidential candidates to articulate very clearly where, where they stand, what they would do, how they would, how their administrations would act towards these topics. Funny you should say that. This very day, Ira Flato on Science Friday, which, you know, uh, right. that's the sure. one on sure. NPR, just like this show, <laughs> um, you know, was talking about why isn't science a, a platform position for these candidates? They talk about everything but science. We have to, we have to force them take positions to understand science, yes. and then, uh, you know, tell, tell you what their platform is. Right, yeah, and they should. Science is more and more impacting on everyone's life every right. day. And right, and you're going to continue to yeah. be that way. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, Ethan Allen doing uh, Science, Likeable Science on Friday. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, Jay. Really appreciate it. Thank you. More stuff.